Jeremiah chapter 20, very familiar well, a portion of the scripture of Jeremiah. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now Pashir, the son of Emer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. What did he prophesy? He prophesied, You repent or you're going to perish. He prophesied, Get right with God or judgment is coming. And the priest who were hired to tickle the ears of everybody else, they were crying peace and safety when God said, I have not spoken to them. And uh, Jeremiah said, I don't care what them fellows said. God said, judgment is coming. Verse number 2, Then Pashir smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks which, uh, that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. It came to pass on the morrow that Pashir brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. Is that what he said? No. The Lord hath not called thy name Pashur, but Magar Misabib. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city, and all the labors thereof, and all the precious things thereof, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah, will I give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them, and take them, and carry them to Babylon. And thou, Pasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die, and shalt be buried there, thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. Now in verse 7, Jeremiah goes from speaking to Pasher to now he begins to speak unto the Lord. He said, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Every one mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay let's pray Father we love you thank you for the good singing Lord is a blessing thank you for the good fellowship that was a blessing thank you for the good prayer time that was a blessing Lord I neglected calling out Miss Noreen's mother Lord touch her you know the need there. Be with the family. The Lord, save her lost loved ones. Now, Father, help us tonight. I do appreciate this Wednesday night crowd. Lord, that many of them have labored, worked their jobs. Many of them have come even without having dinner. They're tired. They face this old world, the old flesh and devil. But on this Wednesday night, this chilly Wednesday night, they're here. And Lord, they're here to hear what thus saith the Lord. So I pray that you'd help your people, you would strengthen them, you would revive them, you would do great things for them and through them, that, Lord, they'd be a great testimony to the greatness of God. Use this unworthy vessel, continue to touch my throat. We'll thank you for it, for it's in the holy name of Jesus we do ask these things. Amen and amen. Uh, there's three things I want you to see as a way of introduction. I want you to see, first of all, the confinement of the stocks. In verse number 2, we find that Jeremiah is in the stocks outside the temple. You know what the stocks are. These young people probably don't. But uh, uh, if they watch an old western, you'll see, or an old pirate movie, they'll see there was a, a big wooden plank with three holes in it that opened up. They put your head and your hands in it. They close it down, and that's how you was confined. 
And he said he was outside the temple. Everybody went to the temple, looked at the old prophet, made fun of him, laughed at him, said, oh, we'll prophesy to us now. He's confined in the stocks. Uh, a couple years ago when we were in St. Thomas, we went through a certain section which was kind of dedicated to pirates, and they had those. They had stocks there. I tried them out. Wasn't a blessing. Huh? Well, mine wasn't locked in them. He was locked in them. He's confined to the stocks. Then we find in verses uh, 4 through 6 the cost of sin. Jeremiah has been preaching some 15 years to them about their sin, about their idol worship, about their false religion, about the mockery that they made of the things of God, uh, how they named God as their God, but they did not worship God, they did not seek God. In chapter number 6, he compels them to get back to the old paths. Uh, that's the good way. They're, they're, therein they would find rest for their souls. Uh, they said, we will not walk therein. Uh, much like in our day and age, uh, folks want a newfangled religion. Uh, they want new worship songs. They want a new Bible. They want uh, uh, the theaters and, and, and all kinds of pageantry. Uh, they want everything but old time preaching, uh, old time singing, uh, old time worship. Uh, they said we don't want that uh, that's not what we're looking for uh, we want coffee bars we want donuts uh, we want theater seating uh, they want everything but God uh, hey thanks be unto God for a remnant uh, that still wants God uh, still wants the old time way uh, still longs to see God move uh, still praying for a revival uh, still wanting to see folks get saved by the good grace of God uh, but we find the cost of sin because they would not, Jeremiah begins to prophesy to this wonderful fellow named Pashir. Verse 3 says, God's called you Magar Misabib. That simply means terror on every side. This man was a terrorist to the nation of Israel because he led them away from the things of God. And God gives him... Uh, Jeremiah, the prophecy of what's going to happen, what the cost of sin is. He says in verse 4, Behold, the Lord says, Behold, I'll make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. Uh, they shall fall by the sword of their enemies. Uh, thine eyes shall behold it. Uh, I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. He shall carry them captive into Babylon and shall slay them with the sword. Uh, moreover, I'll deliver all the strength of this city, all the labors, all the precious things, uh, all the treasures. Uh, I'll give into the hand of their enemies which shall spoil them, take them, carry them to Babylon. Uh, and thou, Pasher, uh, all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity. Uh, thou Thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die, and shalt be buried there, and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. He said, you're all going to have a payday someday. He said, you're going to Babylon, you're going to watch all your friends die there. You're the cause of it, you're going to witness it. All the precious jewels and things of Judah is going to be carried to Babylon. You're going to see it. All uh, 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 of the strength of this city is going to be gone there. You're going to see it. And then you and everybody that dwells in your house is going to go into captivity and you're going to see it and you're going to die there and you're going to be buried there. Can I say it's disgraceful enough that he was going to see all that and he was going to die there? But one of the great disgraces of Israel is if they was buried in a foreign land and not in their homeland. They were, he was going to be buried as a slave instead of a servant of God. Can I say, you cannot sin and win. There is always a cost for sin. Thanks be unto God for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Uh, but friend, if we won't repent, there is a price for sin. And then we see the cry of the servant. We find in verse 7 through 9, Jeremiah cries to the Lord. Can I say, Jeremiah confesses to God twice that he's in derision. He feels like the weight of the nation is upon him. He can get no rest, he can find no peace, he can find no joy. He is in derision. We find that he tells God in verse 7 that he's been deceived. He says, O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me and I am deceived. 
I don't have time to have you look in chapter number one, but God didn't deceive him. God told him this was a stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart people. He says, they will not listen to you, but I've made you an iron pillar to testify against them. But yet Jeremiah feels like he's been deceived. He thought he would preach and everybody would repent and, na and the nation of Israel would go on serving God. Can I say, every young preacher gets on fire for God and they think they're going to turn the world upside down. And I hope every one of them does. But I've seen them. Boy, they think they, they're it. They've got the message. And they'll start preaching it. And then all of a sudden, the rejection, the lack of response, and they feel like, God, you've deceived me. No. Can I say, man hasn't changed. Man has never sought after God. God seeks after man. And man still must let their stony heart be softened by the things of God. And God chooses preaching to do that. And can I say very seldom does everybody hear the gospel the first time and come running to an altar. Most of the time, the preaching of the word of God like a hammer has to break that stony heart so they come to God. Jeremiah is having a big pity party. He's feeling sorry for himself. He's in derision, feels deceived. He's defeated. Hmm? He, he make a good candidate for a good independent Baptist. Hmm? But can I say this? In the midst of his defeat, in the midst of his pity party, feeling deceived, in the midst of being in derision, this thing weighing on him, he's not deterred. Now most of you have heard that message I preached on throwing in the towel. But can I say he is not deterred those things weighing on him has not caused him to quit. Why? Verse number 9. Then I said, I will not speak, or will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Well, right there, he's ready to quit. Then that little conju conjunction, but. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He said, I'm not going to speak anymore in his name. I'm defeated. I'm in derision. I feel deceived. That's it. That's it. That's it. He said, but that burning fire shut up in my bones from the Word of God. He said, I, I couldn't forbear it. He said, as much as the derision was weighing on me, as much as the defeat was weighing on me, as much as all that was coming against me, what I had inside me just compelled me to just keep on keeping on. Hmm? And I got to thinking about that. And I want to preach for a minute on a burning fire. I've never seen a time like today, and I know the Apostle Paul said in the last days perilous times would come, and he gave us a list of a lot of things that would happen that is happening. But I've never seen so many that have named the name of Christ who walk away, and you never ever see them ever get back in. Yes, sir. Jeremiah wanted to walk away. Jeremiah wanted to quit. He said, I'm not going to speak in his, in his name anymore. I'm not going to make mention of him. I'm quitting. I'm, not, I'm giving up. But he said, but there was something that wouldn't let me do it. He said, there was a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. He said, I thought the mocking was bad. I thought the, uh, uh, the, the, the lies and discouragement was bad. I thought all that was bad, uh, being in prison, stock, but that was nothing compared to what was happening when I tried to quit. Hmm? Well, how come so many can quit? Huh? Let me take another step. Boy, Brother J.D. preached Sunday night on swinging the axe handle. Yes, sir. 
Hmm? There are a lot of folks sitting in pews. And I appreciate they come. Appreciate that they got ready and they came out to church and they went through all the traffic and road construction. And, uh, and by the way, that was me that beeped at you when you pulled in your subdivision today. huh? I wasn't beeping at you because it was poor driving. I just knew it was you. I beeped at you. So anyway, huh? She so probably like, who was that honking at me? You probably, you know, horn cussed me back or something, huh? But all the traffic, all the road construction, huh? I appreciate you coming. I appreciate folks coming out. But I appreciate folks. But, but listen, uh, how can folks uh, sit under preaching? Look what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah said, but his word uh, was in mine heart uh, as a burning fire shut up in my bones. How can folks, uh, I'm not talking about the Catholic Church. Uh, I'm not talking about First Church. Uh, I'm not talking about Crossroads. Uh, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about a Bible preaching church uh, where God walks through here, uh, where preaching is done, uh, how folks can come uh, and sit uh, and hear uh, and get up uh, and walk out uh, and nothing ever changes them. It's going here, mm -hmm. but it's not getting there. Hmm? How can folks walk out of here and never read their Bible all week long until they come back? Amen. How can folks uh, never pray? How can folks never think about God? Uh, how can they never listen to singing about God? Uh, how can folks never read a, a, a devotion about God? Uh, how can folks just uh, uh, aimlessly say they're Christian uh, but never have anything to them? He said, there was a burning fire in my heart. My question to you tonight... Where's the fire? We had several request prayer for revival. Where's it at? I'd say in verse number 9, Jeremiah got revived. Where's it at? Every week somebody says, we pray for revival. Why? What did you do with the last one we had? Where's the fire? Amen. Jeremiah said, His word was in my heart as a burning fire. Where's the fire? Now see, a lot of folks come to church because they have friends. A lot of folks come for fellowship. Bless God if I announce we're having food tonight, place be packed. There are folks that never come on Sunday night unless we have food. They'll be here. I'm telling you the truth. You might as well just say amen. Huh? We're having Taco Tuesday, Saturday night. Where do you see the crowd? Huh? Where's the fire? Let me give you some things about someone who's on fire. Can I say one who's on fire screams? You ever seen anybody set on fire? They don't get it set on fire and sit in a pew and say. <laughs> Somebody on fire is screaming their lungs out. Hey, I'm on fire! Can't even get an amen out of you. Where's the fire? If you was on fire, people know it. You'd be screaming. I got news for you. When you get to heaven in your glorified body, you'll be screaming your lungs out. You're going to be hollering, Glory! Hallelujah! Worthy is the Lamb! How come you're not doing that tonight? Where's the fire? Hmm. It amazes me how little it takes to knock people out of church. Sure. I understand when you're sick. Bless God, nobody likes being sick. I don't like being sick. 
Well, you're going to sit around the house? Why well, can't you come out to the house of God? I've had bronchitis for three weeks. I've been here. I'm not bragging on me. But why, why, where else would I be? It's like when Jesus told his disciples, will you go away also? He said, where would we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Where else would I go? Yeah. Amen. I'm just wondering, where's the fire? Amen. One on fire screams. Can I say something? One on fire scurries. Somebody who is on fire cannot stand still. Hmm? There are folks, you never see them in an altar. You never see them excited. You never see anything in their life. I'm telling you, somebody on fire, they can't stand still. They are scurrying about. If you want a, a visual of it, Clint, come here. Let's get some gasoline, set him on fire, see if he sits there. Jeremiah said, in my heart was a burning fire. He says, I was weary with forbearing. I could not stay. Sure. Somebody on fire is motivated to move. Amen. Can I say this? One who is on fire is a spectacle. Amen. He'll draw attention or she'll draw attention. When you're on fire, people are going to take notice that you're on fire. You don't have to get up and boast that you're on fire. Folks will know you're on fire. Huh? When somebody's got a touch of God on it, other people know. Are you listening? To, you don't have to zero, zero yourself out. You'll stand out in a crowd when you're on fire. Huh? Hey, you become a spectacle. Huh? Other folks will say, uh, look at that joker. Something's different about them. Huh? Hey, why? They're on fire. Hmm. Did you ever notice Amen. on the 11 o'clock news if a house catches on fire they got video of it? Did you ever notice how many people out there standing there watching it burn? Yeah. <laughs> it's on fire folks. Sure. The firemen will put it out. Yeah. It'll be alright. Then the next day they're going to drive by and see, the, see what's left. Why is that? It's a natural phenomenon. Fire attracts. Amen. You want know an indictment against the church? You're not on fire. Say, preacher, I'm here. Thank God you're here, but you're not on fire. Because if you was, folks would be taking notice of it. Hmm? Can I say something else? Those on fire seek relief. We've got a burn institute up in Cincinnati. They're moving it to Dayton, by the way. Do you know why? Because burn victims need relief. They seek relief. Miss Nett will tell you in her nursing school the worst thing that they ever had was go up to that burn center. Those people that have been burnt have to go through those skin grafts and go through all that special bandaging and everything. Their very skin hurts them. Those on fire are seeking relief. Amen. If you read Revelation 3 and you see the Laodicean church, they weren't seeking anything because they were comfortable where they were. Right. Yep. Folks not on fire are comfortable. Folks on fire are seeking some help. Amen. Amen. Can I say something else about one on fire? Too often they smother it instead of stoking it. If you've been saved by the good grace of God, at some point in your life you were on fire. Amen. A lot of times we want to give the devil credit, but we smother it rather than stoke it. That's how we lose the fire. It hurts too much being on fire. It hurts too much standing out. It hurts too much. So we smother it rather than stoke it. 
We'd rather blend in than stand out. We'd rather whine and complain like Jeremiah in verses 7 and 8 than experience verse number 9. Where's the fire? Let me show you how the fire is brought through. Fire is brought about and brought through our lives. Four simple things. First one is through honesty. While you pat yourself on the back and say, boy, I'm doing good because I'm here on a Wednesday night, you'll never have the fire. You know when you'll have the fire? When you admit to God you don't have the fire. When you get honest and clean before God and say, God, I'm going through the motions, but the wood's wet. I'm not on fire. I'm doing better than some, but I'm not on fire. See, we like to point out so folks that are worse than us. We like to point out that Sunday morning crowd. Well, they're not on fire. Well, neither are you. Because you're looking at them. Uh, when you're on fire, you're looking at the burning in your heart. You don't care about anybody else because you're on fire. You've got to get honest with God. You'll never get on fire till you do. Can I say the fire is brought through hardship? You know, when Jeremiah realized there was a burning fire shut up in his bones when he'd been through hardship, when he'd been made a mockery, put into prison, felt like even God had deceived him. You know, when you'll get on fire is when you get in agony. When you start agonizing over those lost loved ones you keep requesting prayer for, you'll get on fire. Huh. When you start agonizing over people dying and going to hell. When you start agonizing on the church not being revived. When you start agonizing over your own self just going through the motions, you'll get on fire. But as long as you're comfortable where you are, you'll never get on fire. Can I say he went through hardship? Can I say sometimes God allows us to go through harsh trials so we will agonize so we can get on fire. Can I say, not only through agony, but through adversity. If you read the book of Acts, you'll find the church always grew when she was under persecution. When you are in adversity and facing adversity, that's when you'll get on fire. The indictment of the church of this day and age, we haven't faced any adversity. When the church met in caves and dens and people were burned at the stake and when people were beheaded because they would not recant Jesus Christ, then were folks on fire. Can I say this? Fire is brought through attrition. When you get broken and humble before God, Jeremiah in verse number 9 is broken. And that's when the fire showed up. Fire's brought through honesty, through hardship. The fire's brought through holiness. When you are separated and consecrated for God's holiness, and you seek to be holy for He is holy, you'll get on fire. I had a preacher call me today. I hadn't talked to him in a while. He called me today, asked me a question about the Bible. I said, uh-oh. He said, no, you'll know this is why I'm asking you. He asked me a question, I answered his question. He said, that's what I thought it was. We got to talking. I asked him this question. This guy likes to read, he likes books. I said, when's the last time you saw a book on holiness? He said, well, preacher? I said, I don't know. I said, you won't find one. I said, it hasn't been preached and practiced for nearly a hundred years. You don't find books on holiness. Living holy before God. 
You don't hear preaching on living a holy life. We hear preaching on how to make our lives better. How to deal with the harshness of being bullied on the job. Uh, how to stand out at the gym. How to eat all the donuts you can and still look thin. Really, that's all the preaching is today is fluff. You don't hear preaching on holiness. You don't hear preaching like this that you're hearing tonight because most people won't stand for it. You know when the church was on fire? When the church was holy. You know why you had such zeal for God when you first got saved? Because that was the holiest you've ever been. Let me say this lastly. The fire is brought through hope. When you truly hope in God, you'll be on fire. See, we don't have to hope. We can live life without God. We don't trust anymore. We make our own ways instead of waiting on God. But when you truly hope and rely on God, you'll have a fire. Great preacher, Puritan preacher by the name of Thomas Brooks said this, Hope can see through the thickest clouds. We have a cloud we think God's mad at us. Hope can see through the thickest clouds. The darkest of days. I don't know if you read the devotion today from Brother Jordan. It was outstanding. The problem today is we'll eat anything and think it's sweet. Because we have no fire. I ask you the question, where's the fire? Jeremiah said, the word of God was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. You want to know what it's going to take to have an expansion. You want to know what it's going to take to see young people saved. You want to know what it's going to take to see middle-aged folks saved. You want to know what it's going to take to see older folks saved. You don't want to know what it's going to take to have revival. It's called a fire. And unlike one in your fireplace where one log gets on fire and it'll set another log on fire, it doesn't work that way. You yourself are responsible for your own fire. Will you let God set you on fire? My question is, is why wouldn't you let God set you on fire? Lives are at stake. You have co-workers. You have family. You have neighbors. You have folks who are watching you that you're not even aware. They're watching you. You know what they deserve to see? You on fire. Me on fire. God help us to truly shine as lights in this dark world. And the only way we will is if we're on fire. You can't set yourself on fire. But you can be a beacon waiting to be put on fire by seeking after God. Hmm? God help us to be a torch. Enough of us get on fire, we'll turn this world upside down. Because it's been so long since anybody's seen true spiritual fire, they wouldn't recognize it. God help us to be on fire. It means suffering if it means being separated, if it means uh, sacrificing, whatever it takes to be on fire because seeing one person get born again would be worth it. If you're on fire, say, Preacher, you said somebody screams when they're on fire. Absolutely. And you know what this world needs to hear? Somebody scream in the greatness of God. 
said, preacher, folks will be a spectacle. I don't want folks looking at me. You get on fire, they'll be looking at Jesus, not you. Hmm? Say, preacher, you said that folks are, are, are seeking relief. Yeah, you know where you find relief? In the arms of Jesus when you're on fire. Amen. And by all means, when you get on fire, don't smother it. Stoke it by staying at the feet of Jesus so others can get in the fold before this winds up. You want to see God really move this year? Get on fire. Where's the fire? Say, preacher, how come you didn't preach this Sunday? Because the Sunday crowd couldn't handle it. And by the way, I've got one working for Sunday. This crowd right here tonight, this crowd needs to get on fire. Amen. This is the serious crowd right here. That Sunday morning crowd ain't going to agonize with God. They won't even come back Sunday night. This crowd right here will. Are you willing to get on fire for God? Do whatever it takes. Miss Nett, you sing that song, whatever it takes, Lord. That's what I'll do. How about it? Will we do whatever it takes to get on fire for God? Lives are in the balance. Every one of you mentioned lost folks and relatives. And, well, they're waiting to see something real. Will they see it out of us? God help us to quit losing them to a bunch of charismatics and a bunch of falseness. Let's show them what a true Christian really is. Somebody set on fire for God. Will you be on fire? Say, Jeremiah didn't have many converts if he had any. It doesn't matter. He was on fire. All that's of God. All you can handle is getting on fire. Just get on fire and see what God's doing. What God will do. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song. Folks are praying. Where's your fire? You willing to be on fire? Say, God, set me on fire for your glory. How about it tonight? Folks are praying. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, Lord, set us on fire. Lord, we don't need a meeting. We need a reckoning with God. Set us on fire that others might see something real and holy. Lord, change us, and transform us. That others will take note that we've been with Jesus. God, every one of us know lost folks. We've tried to invite them, tried to tell them. Lord, now we need to show them the fire of God. Oh, God, do work in our hearts this night. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.